Access Minnesota, issues that matter to you. Access Minnesota brings you the newsmakers and the stories that shape our everyday lives with analysis from University of Minnesota faculty experts. Now, here's Jim Dubois. After midnight on May 22, 1970, St. Paul police officers Glenn Cothy and James Sackett responded to a call to transport a woman in labor to the hospital. When the officers reached the house here at 859 Hague Avenue, a shot rang out, fired by an unknown sniper, killing Officer Sackett. In his latest book, Black, White, Blue, The Assassination of Patrolman Sackett, journalist William Swanson takes us back to the night of this infamous crime that remained a cold case for more than 30 years. Swanson sat down with Access Minnesota this month to talk about the significance of the Sackett case in the history of St. Paul and the underlying racial tensions between the African-American community and the city's police. Take us back to the night of May 22, 1970. What lured Jim Sackett and his partner to that fateful address? Well, in those days, this is before uh, the 911 uh, telephone system and the EMT uh, uh, structure. So if you had a medical emergency in the city of St. Paul, you called the police department. And the police department in those days uh, had two or three stretcher cars on the street pretty much all the time. These were station wagons tricked out uh, with medical emergency uh, uh, equipment and, and materials. Um, if, you were, if your sister was having a baby and you needed help, you called the police. Well, that's what happened uh, a few moments after midnight on May 22, 1970. The police uh, headquarters got a call from a young woman who said she was calling from a phone booth and she was saying that her sister was in labor. Uh, her sister was at 859 Hague, she said. Well, two young officers, uh, James Sackett and his partner, Glenn Cothy, were actually in a traffic car that night, sitting over by the state capitol waiting for people to run red lights there. So off they went. Five minutes later, they were in front of 859 Hague. And um, both officers got out expecting to help deliver a baby. Uh, in the back seat of this traffic car, this unlikely muscle car they were driving. Uh, they knocked on the front door. There was no response. Uh, uh, Kothi went around the side of the house to the back, wrapped on the back, heard a dog bark. He leaned over the, the rail on the back stoop and hollered, Jim, watch out, they have a dog. And at that moment, the intersection lit up. There was a tremendous explosion. Uh, Kothi thought it was, it was a big firecracker. And uh, he walked around, uh, back around to the front of the house, and there lay his partner uh, in a spreading pool of blood at the foot of the front steps. Uh, uh, Jim Sackett had been hit by a single slug from a high-powered rifle fired by some unseen sniper uh, standing in the dark across the street. The late 60s and early 70s saw anger over political assassinations, especially that of Martin Luther King Jr., protests over the Vietnam War, and a rise in conflicts between police and the emerging Black Panther Party. In this milieu, shootings, bombings, and riots erupted in most major cities in the U.S., including Minneapolis and St. Paul. In St. Paul, the construction of Highway I-94 cut a swath through the predominantly Black Rondo neighborhood and increased racial tensions in the city. In 1968, a two-day riot shook the Selby Dale neighborhood after a scuffle between young African Americans and police broke out at a concert at Stem Hall, now known as Roy Wilkins Auditorium. Let's go back in time to the early 1960s when Interstate 94 was being constructed in St. Paul. It caused a lot of disruption to the Rondo neighborhood, which at the time was home to many of the city's African American residents. How did the displacement of people in the Rondo neighborhood sort of tee things up for the racial tensions that were to come later in that decade? I think the racial tensions were already there and indeed date back a long, long time. Uh, there had been a vibrant black community in St. Paul, centered, as you say, in the Rondo neighborhood uh, since the late 1800s. Uh, and there had been occasional run-ins with the police, which, as in most cities, was primarily white. I think what the imposition of Interstate 94 did was, was splinter 
a close-knit residential area in a way that it hadn't done before and exacerbated uh, whatever tensions were already there. There was a lot besides that that was going on, however. I mean, this was nationwide, even internationally, this was a time of the late 60s and early 70s was a time of significant racial churn. In the late 1960s, there was a great deal of racial unrest, some of which turned violent. Uh, even in Minneapolis, there were a couple of riots on the city's north side in 1967 and 1968. But St. Paul had largely escaped that until August of 1968 and an incident that took place at Stem Hall. Tell us more about that. Stem Hall uh, was a site of a young people's concert uh, on a Friday night uh, during the, the Labor Day weekend in 1968. And uh, there's various accounts of what happened and what precipitated uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the violence. Uh, but there did ensue a riot uh, after police um, uh, uh, closed in on the, on the mostly black teenage crowd. And it was, a, it was a, a running battle, if you will, from downtown, uh, from Stem Hall, uh, up to the hill, up to the Summit University area where most of the blacks were living in those days. And there was an off and on skirmish, including firebombs and, and, uh, and uh, uh, gunfire and occasional uh, uh, physical attacks on passersby and reporters, uh, off and on for two days. It really shook up the city of St. Paul. Prior to the Sackett murder, there had been a number of shootings by the St. Paul police involving members of the African American community. Tell us about some of the more notorious of those shootings and how they may have further fueled the racial tensions. Well, the most uh, important of those uh, incidents uh, occurred in February of 1970, just a couple of months before Jim Sackett was assassinated. Uh, two separate shootings involving white police officers and young black men, Wayne Massey uh, and um, Keith Barnes. They were shot in separate incidents uh, in, in the Rondo area uh, by white police. And uh, in both cases, there was a crime being committed at the time, or at least the allegations of a crime. Um, but in both cases, it was a, a white officer shooting and killing a black young man and uh, within a couple of weeks of each other. So that really, really turned up the heat and really increased the already existing tensions in the neighborhood. We should mention that the policies for police to use deadly force were, were different in those times, weren't they? Yes, it, it was the, the police, uh, both by law and by uh, departmental regs, were uh, allowed to use deadly force uh, trying to stop a felon, for instance, or s somebody in the act of felony or trying to escape an act of felony. Um, more than one police officer uh, ba from back in the day told me that uh, the St. Paul police did a lot of shooting. Uh, trigger happy might be a little strong, but uh, th there was a lot of shooting. I might add that there was shooting the other way, too. Uh, some of the old cops reported um, uh, being in their squad cars uh, driving through the Selby Dale area in the late 60s and early 70s and, and hearing a gun being cocked, or in some cases even uh, hearing the ping of a bullet. Although Sackett and Kothi had no idea what awaited them when they made the trip to 859 Hague, there had been a, a warning of sorts in the days prior to the shooting. Tell us more about that. There was revolution in the air, as Bob Dylan memorably put it. Um, so everybody was, was generally alert to the potential danger to the police or the National Guard or whoever represented the establishment. Um, specifically though, there was a comment uh, by another young man named Eddie Garrett who was stopped by the police uh, just on a, on a whim, which sometimes happened, uh, about a week before Sackett's murder. And they confiscated a pistol that he had in his glove box. And as they were talking, Garrett told these two officers, watch the rooftops. 
Now that was a catchphrase that had been used kind of around the country. And it suggested, be careful, there, there, there are guys out there who are going to exact revenge on you thumpers. Uh, so that was, you know, that was a week before, but it was not, it didn't say we're going to get you guys on May 22nd. It, did, it, it, you know, there, there was nothing more specific than that. Sackett and Kothi both knew the, uh, the, uh, the dangers on the hill in those days. Both knew that there were a lot of people who were very angry uh, with the white police uh, in that part of the city. But when they pulled up that night thinking they were going to help deliver a baby, there was no indication, and I've talked several times to Glenn Cothy, uh, there were no indications that they were the least bit concerned about being attacked. Jim Sackett was truly an innocent victim in this case. He had been a police officer about a little less than two and a half years, was not known as a thumper as, as some of the officers who may have uh, used excessive force at times, was involved in, in one shooting for which he, uh, was, he was quite upset by it. What must have really hit the police is they realized this is not a vendetta against a single person. This is a vendetta against all of us who are police officers. What was the immediate reaction on the part of Sackett's fellow officers following the shooting? Well, shock, uh, to say the least. Shock and grief and a tremendous anger. Uh, there had been 25 police officers shot and killed in the line of duty in St. Paul up to that point. And they had died in all manner of, of, of ways, uh, gunshots, stabbings, uh, ac car accidents on the way to a crime or chasing a, a felon. Uh, only Jim Sackett had been assassinated, had been set up and killed, not because it was Jim Sackett, because remember the assassin and the person who made that bogus OB call, as they called it, uh, couldn't have known who was going to show up. They didn't know, you know, they wanted a police officer. They wanted to kill a police officer, and uh, any police officer would do. So the, the, the rage, needless to say, when, a, when an officer is, is cut down uh, in the line of duty, uh, the, the thin blue line, uh, the, the blue brotherhood, uh, is, is aroused and they never forget. When Access Minnesota continues, author William Swanson discusses the investigation of the Sackett murder. Access Minnesota will return after these messages.